Well, welcome to North. My name is Tim, and they let me be one of the pastors here. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you today. I am so excited to be celebrating the last Sunday of the year with you. Uh, I just want you to know at the conclusion of the service, I'm going to say Merry Christmas because I'm still saying Merry Christmas. Anybody with me? Yeah, Merry Christmas. Glad you guys are here. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, our senior pastor, Mike Towner, has been walking us through a series called Hope is Here, uh, where he laid out some very key foundational truths for the Christian life. So if you're a follower of Jesus and you have missed some of those uh, messages, I encourage you to go back and to, to get those on our website or on our YouTube page, however you can access those. If you're not yet a Christian and you're curious about why uh, Christians talk so much about Jesus and why he's such a big deal, I encourage you to go back and, 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 and watch those sermons because some great truth, some great foundational stuff that you'll need uh, to know there. Today, I want, to, uh, I want to pick up from there, and I want to talk about hope also, but I want to talk about hope in the context of this feeling, this emotion, this state uh, of hopelessness that we sometimes find ourselves in. We all experience it. I trust that you, like me, have had something happen. You've had an occasion uh, where you walked into a situation or where something happened to you or something began happening inside of you and all of a sudden you came up against that moment and you just wanted to throw your hands up and walk away and say, this is just hopeless. Anybody with me this morning? It happens, right? We've all been there. Uh, maybe this has happened to you. I feel hopeless often. Uh, it's just something that comes up inside of me. For example, uh, if you've ever uh, been doing the laundry and you get all of the warm laundry out of the dryer and it's in the basket and you, you take it and you sort it and you fold it uh, and you hang it up uh, and then you're working through it and you're getting it all done and then you get to the bottom of the basket and you find this. <laughs> this is the universal symbol for hopelessness. You've got one solo sock in the bottom of the basket. Some of you right now, you do the laundry in your house. You are anxious because you know I left the house today with just one of these and not the other one, and you are certain they will never find their way back to each other. <laughs> because you, what happens, right? Like you're doing the laundry and you wanna be done, you wanna complete it, and you find this sock. And for a moment, maybe you hold on and you think, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hold on to this until the other one comes through the wash, and then I'll match them back up. But we've all lived long enough to know that that other sock is long gone. That is a pipe dream. What happened was you wore these socks at the same time. You took them off at the same place. You put them in the same hamper. You loaded them into the same washing machine, and then an alien abducted the other one. The lint trap in your dryer has eaten it, or a thief has broken into your home and has robbed you of your other sock. And now all plans of finishing the laundry are dashed because the idea that you will ever find this sock's mate again is in fact hopeless. Can I get an amen? amen. Maybe for you it's not socks. Maybe for you, you have spent your life dedicated to a team that is never gonna make the playoffs. Maybe for you, your house is just never gonna be clean. It's just hopeless. Maybe the boss is never going to acknowledge your individual effort for the company. Maybe you're in a relationship that feels like you're in a hopeless cycle where you get frustrated with each other and then you say things you don't mean and then they say things they don't mean and then you start to wonder whether or not you actually mean the things that you said to each other and on and on it goes and it feels hopeless. Maybe the doctors didn't have good news and the diagnosis seems pretty inevitable. Maybe you see all of the happy couples around you and you're afraid that that's never going to happen for you. Maybe in a season filled with joy and peace, it's the constant reminder to you that your life is neither peaceful nor joyous. And what we really need when we come into this season of hopelessness is hope, right? If hope is what is lacking, that's what we need. We need to step out of, out of our hopelessness into hope. And, and this is a universal problem, and it's something throughout history that we've tried to solve. Great thinkers, great achievers have tried to say things to inspire us to hold out for hope. They've said things like, like I never met a, a rich pessimist. Or Winston Churchill said, 
The optimist finds opportunity in every difficulty, not difficulty in every opportunity. Or Wayne Gretzky, the great one, said, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. You just gotta be optimistic. You just gotta see life from the right angle, the right vantage point. In 1912, Christian Larson wrote the Optimist Creed. You could hang the Optimist Creed on your wall. It would say this, promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. To talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. To make all your friends feel like there is something for them. To look at the sunny side of everything and to make your optimism come true. To think only of the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on toward the greater achievement of the future to wear a cheerful countenance at all times, and to give every living creature you meet a smile, to give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others, to be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. See, here's what happens. There's good advice in there. There's some great things. There's some encouragement there. But let's just get gut level check real. In hopelessness, optimism is not what I need. We confuse optimism and hope. And so we say hope is here or we gotta find hope in hopelessness and we kind of twist it culturally into you just have to be optimistic. You just have to kind of look to the future. You just have to see things better than they are. But here's here's what's interesting. All throughout the Bible, all throughout the scriptures, there is account after account after account of people who find themselves in hopeless situations. And not one time is the prescription for their hopelessness to just see the glass half full instead of half empty. Not one time. Because the scripture doesn't point us towards optimism in hopelessness. It points us toward hope, real hope. And so today, I just I wanna take a passage out of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's right at the very top of the, of the book. It's a great book. Uh, I relate to it well. I, I really enjoy uh, the story here that Nehemiah lays out for us, the events of his life. But right here at the top, he's writing kind of in a journal, and he's gonna talk to us about hopelessness and finding the hope in it. And, and here's what he says, uh, chapter one, verse one. He says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakalel. In late autumn, in the month of Keslov, in the 12th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress in Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the providence of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So here's what's happening. Nehemiah is working in the capital city. He is not a prophet or a priest or a preacher. He's actually a part of the royal court. He works for the royalty there. And he is... um, He's a Hebrew, he's Jewish, so his ancestors are from Jerusalem. That would have been where his people were from. And so what happened was the Babylonians came through about 140, 150 years before this moment in Nehemiah's life. They came through and they destroyed Jerusalem. They conquered the people. They knocked down the walls, they burned the gates, they defeated the armies, and they took the people and they scattered them, okay? And so what has happened now is some have started to return back to Jerusalem, Some of Nehemiah's people, they want to go back to Jerusalem. They want to rebuild the city. They want to begin to worship God there again. That's what they want to do. And so they've started to do this process. And so some friends come to Nehemiah who have been there, and they've heard from there. And Nehemiah says, well, what's it like? And they say, look, it's really bad. It's really bad. Like all of the hopes and dreams that the people had when they set out to return to the city, none of it is working. It's really, really dark. It's really, really dire. This once great city sits in ruins still, he says. Now, listen to the way that Nehemiah puts this. It's very interesting, the words that he uses. He says that they said that things were not going well, and that in verse three, that they are in great trouble and disgrace, and that the walls of Jerusalem have been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. 
if you really look closely, you can see the hopelessness in the description, right? Because he says that they're in trouble. Now, we know that trouble is different than having a problem, right? You got a problem, that's way different than trouble. Like a problem, okay, if you have a problem, it necessitates a solution, so we can work through a problem. I got a problem, either I can solve it or work it out, or I know somebody who can help me solve it or work it out, or I can find a YouTube video, because we got a YouTube video for everything. You got a problem, they can solve it, right? That's what you gotta do, because you got a problem that necessitates a solution. Trouble is a whole other level. Trouble is when I have so many problems, or the problem is so big, I cannot fix it, and I cannot see a way out of it. And he says that the people here, they weren't just in trouble, they were in great trouble. And then he also says that they were in disgrace, right? Shame, uh, humiliation, embarrassment, distress, guilt. Over what? What do they feel so guilty about? What are they so ashamed of? What are they so embarrassed about? Their trouble. Because that's the nature of trouble, right? When we've got a problem, we're working to a solution. But when we find ourselves in trouble, we somehow think we're the only one in trouble. We're the only one who's ever been this way. And we get embarrassed and we clam up and we don't tell anybody about our trouble. We just sort of try to make our way through it. And then he says this, that the walls and the gates were gone. The walls had been destroyed. They've been knocked down. In the ancient world, your walls around your city, they were the greatest military weapon you had because what good was an army if you didn't have a fortified place from which your army to move? If the army was just out in the open country, they were vulnerable. So an army did you no good if you didn't have walls. Well, at one time, Jerusalem had walls and they probably were really proud of them. They probably felt really good about them, but not now. Now they're embarrassed by their walls. Why would we even rebuild these? They're just, someone, someone bigger and stronger is just gonna come knock them down. Why would we even put the effort in? It says the gates were destroyed by fire. There wasn't even anything left of the gates. There was, it's not even worth mentioning what's left of the gates. They were destroyed by fire. This left the people vulnerable to all types of attack. All types of, of, of problem could come into their life. More trouble is on the way because of their vulnerability. And do you see it? Like the trouble that is illustrated in this passage is how trouble works in our lives. It is the hopelessness that we feel around us, isn't it? That we would be in trouble in a situation where we can't see the solution and we can't fix it ourselves and then we feel shame and guilt over that and then we just leave ourselves in a place of vulnerability and it just feels hopeless. It just feels hopeless. And this hopelessness that is found, illustrated historically, is the same hopelessness that we carry around with us, inside of us, and around us. But here's the turn, right? There is good news the day after Christmas. There is hope. There is actually real hope. There's hope that can sustain. See, we don't have to just cling to optimism. We can actually grasp hope. Watch what happens with Nehemiah. Here, listen to his response. Verse four, Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. Might write that down or circle that, some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So when he says some days, Nehemiah is being a dude. Because if we keep reading, I think in chapter two, it tells us that some days was three or four months Nehemiah's world was rocked, and when he wrote it down, he was like, I mean, I cried some. He, he didn't just have an ugly cry and then go home. Everything changed. For three or four months, he cried out to God, and he fasted, and he, and he wailed, and he prayed, and he asked God for, for a solution, and he asked God for help. And then we'll go on to read. If you continue on in the book of Nehemiah, you find out that Nehemiah goes and quits his job but he, he, and to start this new job. Nehemiah is gonna go be this project manager and he's gonna rebuild these walls, but he goes to the king and quits his job, which put his life on the line. And then not only king am I quitting my job to go start a new job, I need you to pay for my new job. Nehemiah just gets all kinds of bold and he puts his life on the line and he sacrifices and he moves and he leaves the whole life he's ever known and he's never going back because he's heartbroken over the hopelessness that he sees in the people that he cares about. So here we are, right? We're kind of in two camps today. 
Like we got people like you came in and Christmas has been great, but like the distraction of the lights and the presents is about to be over and I'm just gonna walk back into kind of this hopeless life that I sort of live in. And then there's others who they have the hope and you're holding on to the hope. Well, for those who are hopeless, I wanna continue on and tell you some more about the hope that is yours in Christ today. But for those of you who have that hope in Christ, when was the last time you looked at the hopelessness around you and it just broke you? When was the last time that you knew that you had neighbors who were on their way to a godless eternity and it just wrecked you? This is what happened to Nehemiah. And see, here's what happens. I like to relate to Nehemiah. And so sometimes when we read this passage, we read you know, this account we like to kind of put ourselves in the story. We like to like read ourselves in. And that's fine, it's, it's an easy thing to do. But what I like to do, I do this all the time when I read this, is I try to put myself in the place of Nehemiah. I play the Nehemiah character. But that's not reality. The reality is not that I am Nehemiah. The reality is that I am the people who are hopeless. Scripture says that I am hopeless apart from from Christ. See, this is the reality of our world. The outside hopelessness that we feel, the events, the situations, the circumstances, the emotions, they are all attributed to sin, the brokenness around us, and they point us towards the real source of hopelessness, which is the fact that we are broken by sin and separated from God. And there is hope in the hopelessness. See, just like Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, Jesus came for us. Just like Nehemiah went to rescue those in Jerusalem, Jesus came to earth for us. But Jesus didn't come because I had a problem and I needed to be better. Jesus came because I was hopeless and in trouble and he came to rescue me out of it. This is the day after Christmas. That's where the amen goes. Let's try again. Jesus did not come because I have a problem and he needed to make it better, make me better. Jesus came because I was in trouble and hopeless and he rescued me out of it. Amen. Knew you'd be there for me. <laughs> Romans 5.8 says this. But God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. It's the description. See, when you read something in the Old Testament, there's like this type and shadow. There's this, this mirroring of what's going to happen with Jesus. And so just like the people of Israel, they were harassed and they were vulnerable and they were ashamed and, and, and they, were, you know, they were hopeless. Nehemiah comes from the outside. He, he comes to rescue. Well, you and I, because of sin, we are in that same state of hopelessness. We can't fix it on our own. We're in great trouble. We're in shame. We're in disgrace. And Jesus comes from the outside to rescue us. Your pain, your, your hopelessness, the, the, the things that you feel around us, they're not trivial. They're not unimportant. They're very real. And the purpose that they serve, the purpose that those frustrations serve in our lives is to point us inward towards the real hopelessness, which is that we are broken by sin and separated from God. And Jesus has come to make things right between us and God. In 1847, there was a French poet named Rockmar. And he was asked to pen a poem for the Christmas Mass. Inspired by what he read in the Gospel of Luke, he wrote what would become known in America as the, the Christmas song of O Holy Night. And there's a line in this song that, you know, you sing the Christmas carols and, you know, you just kind of sing through them, you, you blow right by them, you don't think too much, but he, he actually paints this picture of hopelessness within the song, within this poem that became a song. He wrote these words, long lay the world in sin and error pining. For a long time, he says, we were in sin and error and we were just worried about it. We were just pining around. We couldn't find a solution. Long lay the world in sin and error and pining until he appeared and the soul felt its worth. So just as the people of Jerusalem were hopeless until Nehemiah showed up, you and I were hopeless until Jesus' birth. And if we're true, if we're telling the truth, we all like kind of like Jesus in the manger, right? We all, we, who doesn't like a baby? We all, we all like Jesus the baby. But the story really isn't about Jesus the baby. 
Because Jesus the baby grew up and became a man. And, and he went to the cross and he died on the cross for my sins and for yours. And this is, listen, I'm just gonna tell you, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I need you to understand something. I know that is insane. That's nuts. That's crazy talk. That one man can die on the cross one time and take away the sins of the entire world? Ridiculous. It's impossible. Unless. Unless that man is God. And so here's what he did. He predicted his death and said that he was gonna die on the cross for the sins of the entire world. And then he said, to prove that I'm God, I'm gonna rise from the grave three days later. And he did that also. And he did it because you and me and everyone you know, we got more than a problem, we're in trouble. We can't fix it ourselves and we can't get out of it. So he came to rescue us from it. Sometimes we don't stop and think about it. We don't stop and think about our hopeless need until we start feeling the external pressure start to weigh in on us. But let me ask you, on the last Sunday of the year, do you need someone like Nehemiah to come save you? Do you need 2022 to be a year of restoration? Then you can turn to Jesus now. Listen, I'm not the only one who thinks that. I'm not the only one who believes that. You don't have to take my word for it. It's all over the pages of God's word, but it's all over this room. If you know Jesus already, help me out. Help me preach this message. If you are already a follower of Jesus, if you are speaking to those who needed rescue today, can Jesus save if he can? Say he can. Can Jesus restore if he can? Say he will. Can Jesus save and if he can, say he did. Like Nehemiah went to the people of Israel, Jesus has come for us. He was born in a manger. He grew up, he took your sin, he took mine upon himself. He died on the cross to take away our sins. And the scripture says that if we will put our full weight, our full trust in him, we can be rescued out of our hopelessness. Our circumstances may not change. The things happening around us may still be difficult. But we'll have hope in the hopelessness. Or we can keep doing life our way and just try to hold on to the optimism. I choose Jesus. If you'd like to choose Jesus, I'm gonna pray in just a minute and I'm gonna uh, lead you in a prayer. There's nothing magic or special about the words that I use in this prayer. You can say it however you want, but there was a time in my life where I needed some help with some words on how to talk to God and someone gave me some words and so I'd like to offer you some words to follow along with today if, if you'd like. So let's pray. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus, you can pray along with me. Lord, we come to you and we're so thankful that you sent Jesus Christmas. We're so thankful for the salvation that he provided. Lord, we come to you now, and for those who are in the room and, and watching online, Lord, I pray if they don't know you, that right now, by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to them. That you would just move inside of them, that they would know that they need to pray to receive you. And if that's you, you would just pray something like this. You would say, God, I know that I am a sinner that I cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins and that he rose three days later. I believe that. And I commit my life from this day forward to you. And then you can just say whatever you want to to him. Father, we thank you right now for those that you are rescuing out of hopelessness, those that you are rescuing from sin. For those of us in the room, Lord, who... We call you Savior, we call you Father, we call you Lord, we repent. On the last day of the year, last Sunday of the year, Lord, we repent that we have not been as brokenhearted as we should be over the lost and hopelessness around us. There are people that we know that need you. We pray, God, that you would break our hearts, that you would wreck us like you wrecked Nehemiah. Father, we're so grateful for the power that you have to save for the hope that only you can bring. We're so grateful for the victory that we find only in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.